Good evening and uh, welcome to Together Facing Blood Cancers. I wanna start by thanking our patients, our caregivers, our advocates and guests for joining us tonight. So my name is David Wiest. <clears throat> I'm the Deputy Chief Science Officer at Fox Chase Cancer Center. And tonight my colleagues and I are excited to share with you the latest research and treatment develops, developments for blood cancer. Uh, we wish we could meet with you in person, but you know, COVID had different plans. Uh, and so we're happy to meet with you any way we can. And so it's great uh, that uh, meeting virtually uh, enables us to, to reach a much larger audience and allows people to, to participate in this event that wouldn't otherwise be able to do so. So thank you. Um, if you're watching um, on a Facebook account, we encourage you that if you have questions at any time uh, during, the, um, during the event that you put that question in the chat feature. And, uh, and after the initial introductions, we'll do everything we can to answer those questions uh, during the program itself. But if uh, we run out of time, we'll answer those questions afterwards. So please do uh, put those questions in the chat feature. So as we, as we do anytime we have a Together Facing event, uh, we begin by honoring um, those who we've lost to cancer. So please join me uh, in a moment of silence. Thank you. So um, we, I'll start by first thanking our exhibitors for this evening because without their generous support, uh, we would not be able to offer this free program tonight. So special thanks to our uh, gold exhibitors, uh, Karis and Tempus, our silver exhibitors, uh, Adaptive, ADC Therapeutics, Amgen, Bygene, Epizyme, Genentech, GlaxoSmithKline, Insight, Janssen, Cariofarm, Kite Pharma, Oncopeptides, Sanofi Genzyme, CGen, and Takeda. And in addition, I'd like to thank our advocacy groups, the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, Leukemia Research Foundation, and the Lymphoma Research Foundation. So we're gonna begin by um, having all of the panelists uh, introduce themselves, so I'll start. Um, so I'm David Wiest, as I'd mentioned, I'm the, the Deputy Science Director at Fox Chase Cancer Center. I've been here a very long time, 26 years, and uh, my role at the center, in addition to uh, providing guidance to the overall uh, overarching scientific mission, is I have my own laboratory. And that laboratory is focused on, on studying blood cancers and how to develop better treatments for them. And one of the reasons, not the only reason, but one of the reasons that I study blood cancers is when I was a child, uh, a second grade student, I lost a classmate to acute uh, lymphoblastic leukemia. It left an impression. And uh, you know, back when I was a kid, a long, long time ago in the 60s, um, acute leukemias were a death sentence. Um, and now, because of the efforts of researchers and, and uh, talented clinicians like we have on the panel tonight, um, childhood uh, leukemias are very treatable. And that's, uh, that's great news. Uh, but I think there's room for improvement. And that's what I'm seeking to provide. Um, and so in doing so, I follow in the footsteps of our first scientific director, Stanley Ryman, uh, who was a scientific director back during the Depression. And he actually used to give piano concertos to, uh, to keep the lights on uh, and the doors open uh, because times were tough. Uh, but Stanley Ryman had a revolutionary idea at the time. And that was that if you want to understand cancer, you first have to understand how normal cells work. And so that's, that's what my laboratory does. Um, all of your blood comes from stem cells that are, that are in your bone marrow. And uh, stem cells are like uh, pre preschoolers. Um, they have every career option ahead of them. Um, and uh, as they're educated and move forward in life, those career options get pared down to a manageable number uh, in the same way that a stem cell has to decide what it wants to be when it grows up, either a red blood cell or a white blood cell. And these um, developmental processes and, uh, and molecular changes that happen are very critical for the development of normal blood cells. But it's interesting that those are exactly the same things that go wrong in cancer. Uh, the, the proteins and the genes that regulate how normal blood behaves are often those that, that drive them to do crazy things and become cancerous. And so that's what my lab studies. And we study one particular gene that we've identified that is a, a critical regulator of normal blood cell development, but also controls the extent to which it can become cancerous. Um, either um, two diseases, one's called acute myeloid leukemia and the other is acute lymphoblastic leukemia. And this gene um, sort of acts as a brake pedal uh, to prevent those diseases from happening. And so 
we find that in a number of patients, this gene is lost or it's, it's expressed at too low a level to do its job. And so we're trying to find out how this change or this reduced level of this gene changes the cellular wiring. Um, and in doing so, we'll find out things that we can use against those cells. Uh, and we've identified one such process. In fact, um, this gene regulates what cells like to eat. Uh, and so um, the, cell, uh, the cell process is called fatty acid oxidation. So these cells like to eat fat. Um, and so, you know, like a lot of us, I mean, I like to eat uh, fatty things like ice, ice cream, right? So these cells like it too. And so what my lab is trying to do is to use that against those cells. And so we've identified the enzymes that regulate that. And we're testing whether drugs that block those enzymes are particularly good um, at killing those kinds of leukemia cells. Um, and so that's, that's in a nutshell, what my laboratory is interested in doing. And we hope that we can bring those insights uh, to the clinic um, in the near future. So uh, thanks for indulging me. So now we'll move on to our other panelists. We'll start with uh, Dr. Michael Styler, who's an associate professor at Fox Chase and works in the Fox Chase uh, Temple Bone Marrow Transplant Unit. And so Michael, can you tell us something about uh, what you do and what, uh, what new treatments are available for leukemias? Sure, I'll be happy to, at least. Um, so I take care of a variety of patients with advanced blood cancers. Um, both traditional therapies as well as, as uh, some experimental therapies and uh, including things like autologous bone marrow transplant, allogeneic bone marrow transplant, and recently CAR-T cellular therapies. So just to, to briefly discuss these diseases and some of the uh, latest developments that we have to offer, um, I'd like to, to review acute leukemia initially. So patients who have acute leukemia um, you know, are often quite ill and, and have uh, very low blood counts requiring transfusions. Unfortunately, it's a disease of the elderly, which makes treatment fairly difficult. Until recently, the only available treatment was regular conventional intensive chemotherapy that necessitated long hospitalizations, often with poor outcomes. And so many patients either weren't offered treatment or weren't really felt to be eligible for treatment. In the last couple of years, very effective, much better tolerated treatments have been developed such that most patients with acute leukemia can receive an outpatient regimen of five to seven days of an intravenous medication along with pills. And many of these patients will achieve remission on this treatment. And some even then can go on to, to be consolidated and cured with a stem cell transplant. We're also starting to find so-called targeted therapies for patients with leukemia. So whenever someone's leukemia is diagnosed, some of their cells are sent to the laboratory, the genes are analyzed, and, and uh, we try to look for mutations in, in known cells that may be amenable to a targeted treatment. A uh, couple of examples, there's a, a couple of enzymes called IDH1 and IDH2, and they're now oral medications that are effective for patients whose leukemia has relapsed, um, and we can often put patients back into remission, treating them primarily as an outpatient with minimal toxicity. So the goal of our future therapies is to try to get more and more targeted therapies with less and less toxicity. Still, transplant is, is very commonly a, the right treatment for patients with leukemia. For acute leukemia, it's mainly allogeneic transplants, which involves getting cells from someone else, destroying their leukemia with treatment, and then reinfusing new cells from a suitable donor. In the past, finding the suitable donor was difficult, but nowadays with a robust registry and um, typing family members, we can typically find a suitable match for almost anyone. In the last few years, we've successfully been able to develop methods of doing transplants with patients who are only half matched with their donor. And so that really opens it up to, to virtually everyone. Age is a limitation for transplant, but in the last decade, really, um, we've developed a number of so-called non-myeloablative, less toxic chemotherapy regimens that make it feasible for select patients well into their 70s to undergo an allogeneic transplant, potentially be cured. 
when patients are, are not eligible for transplant, there are now no, no, a number of other treatments we have to offer. So for instance, that relatively benign outpatient treatment that's used to get them in remission is so non-toxic and not doesn't have cumulative effects such that patients can continue to receive this monthly and stay in remission for months to years. Very recently, an all oral regimen, a variant of the, the intravenous drug called azacitidine has been approved for maintenance therapy. So patients who achieve remission can then go on this pill that they take for two weeks on, two weeks off, and it's about double the duration of remission for such patients. We also participate in some clinical trials to try to further advance the field. One promising uh, study that we're, we're uh, just getting ready to open looks at adding an oral drug to a, a, a variant of vitamin A that seems to help these leukemic cells differentiate, live their normal lives and die off and allow healthy cells to recover. Another treatment that we, we uh, and another condition that we treat a lot of patients with is multiple myeloma. So this is again, a, a condition of the elderly, um, but with current treatments, it's really become a, a chronic condition. Patients can expect to live for many years with, with uh, multiple myeloma, both on and off treatment. The, we, we rarely use traditional chemotherapy anymore. The, the standard treatments involve combination of well-tolerated oral and subcutaneous uh, regimens. Still, the, 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 the patients who respond well to therapy seem to benefit from a consolidation with an intensive treatment and an autologous stem cell transplant. So patients who've responded to their initial treatment have their stem cells collected. We give them a strong dose of chemotherapy and then reinfuse their, their cryopreserved cells. Um, and that seems to both strengthen the remission, patients live longer without needing newer therapies. Um, not everybody's a candidate for that. And really the goal, I think, of our, our research is to make that intensive therapy less and less necessary. So for instance, we're trying to add new drugs to the standard regimens. Um, in the last few months, the addition of an antibody treatment called daratumumab to the standard three drug regimen has been shown to significantly prolong the, the response to therapy and the time until patients need a, a new treatment. So that gives you a flavor of, of what uh, we're trying to achieve. Um, some of the, the more recent advances have been uh, developed for patients who've relapsed despite those standard therapies. And again, because we know these are older patients and maybe not able to tolerate traditional therapy, we're trying to, to develop regimens that are well tolerated. And they're, they're pretty uh, sophisticated and, and uh, interesting combination. So uh, one drug that has recently been approved is a combination of an antibody, that is a, a protein that, that recognizes something on the myeloma cells. The cells then ingest that antibody and attach to it as a, a kind of chemotherapy. So the chemotherapy gets in the cell that way, gets cleaved off, kills the cell with minimal chemotherapy effects to the rest of the tissues. There's also in development a, or a, another new drug that's a combination of a, a protein attached to a chemotherapy. It works the same way. It gets ingested by the cell, the protein part gets cleaved off, the chemotherapy kills the cell without much toxicity. Another experimental treatment that I think will be approved fairly soon for myeloma is a, what's called a bispecific antibody. I think Dr. Khan will talk more about that's use in, in uh, lymphoma shortly, but there's development in myeloma of an antibody that, that targets both the, uh, something on the surface of the myeloma cell and the T lymphocyte and brings them together to attack, for the lymphocyte to attack the myeloma cell. And I'm gonna talk more in a moment about CAR T therapy, which right now is experimental for myeloma, but is an established treatment for lymphomas. So the last topic I'm gonna to briefly go through is recurrent lymphomas. I see patients after they've failed the, the traditional therapy uh, for, for lymphoma. Traditionally, once somebody's lymphoma has come back after initial therapy, it's not cured, curable with standard treatments anymore. But we do still have a, a chance to cure you by giving um, a 
high dose therapy and a transplant. So the way we break it down is patients relapse, they get salvage therapy. And if their lymphoma is sensitive to that salvage therapy, we can then go on to potentially cure a substantial number of patients by giving high dose therapy and then rescuing them by reinfusing their own stem cells that were collected previously. If the, the lymphoma proved to be resistant to the initial salvage therapy, that approach doesn't seem to work. Patients um, are virtually never cured. So one thing that's been tried in the past was an allogeneic transplant using cells from a, a matched donor, hoping that as they grow in, in the patient, the new immune system will go after the lymphoma. That was modestly successful, but a, a much more toxic type of transplant. So in the last several years, a, a new immunotherapy called CAR-T has been developed. So that stands for chimeric antigen receptor therapy. And basically what's done is we collect lymphocytes um, from the patient. They're then sent to a laboratory where they're engineered basically to recognize something on the surface of the patient's lymphoma as foreign and uh, attack it and, and kill the cells. The, the, the treatment involves an infusion of these engineered cells, and then um, they kind of reproduce within the, the patient and attack the lymphoma. It's not a, a benign process, but it's much better tolerated than an uh, allogeneic transplant for sure. And we, we had very impressive results, even in patients with very resistant lymphoma. Uh, the thinking is that in time, it may replace autologous transplant and move further up in, in the treatment armamentarium. Although right now it's, it's being used for patients with resistant disease. And even there we're seeing 30, 40% of patients having long-term prolonged survival. So with that, I'm gonna conclude and uh, I'd be happy to answer questions at the end of the session that, that this may have uh, brought up. Thanks, Michael, that was really informative. Um, so our, our next panelist is uh, Dr. Nadia Khan who's an assistant professor in the Department of Hematology and Oncology at Fox Chase. So Nadia. Thank you, Dave. Hi, everyone. It's great to be with you this evening. I'm a lymphoma clinician at Fox Chase Cancer Center, and I've been here since 2013 uh, when I finished my fellowship at Georgetown. I trained with Bruce Chesson, who is very well known in the fields of CLL and lymphoma. And it was while a fellow there with Dr. Chesson um, in clinic that I was first exposed to clinical trials with targeted therapies. And it was at that time that I became very impressed with the successes that we saw in the treatment of our patients. And fortunately, we were able to offer patients at that time some targeted oral therapies and in some cases infusional therapies that were not chemotherapeutics. So they allowed patients to undergo treatments that were better tolerated than traditional chemotherapy. And over the last couple of years, some of those agents have become FDA approved and have really transformed the treatment landscape for B-cell malignancies and CLL. So the, um, the field of lymphoma is a vast one. There are more than 30 subtypes of non-Hodgkin lymphoma. I treat the spectrum of lymphomas from low grade or indolent slow growing diseases like CLL, chronic lymphocytic leukemia, all the way to the more aggressive histologies, including diffuse large B cell lymphoma. But one of the themes of my research in particular is overcoming resistance mechanisms in all of these diseases and trying to understand what drives these diseases um, to proliferate and what therapies can be combined um, to overcome those limitations. And so I'm very excited by our clinical trial portfolio at Fox Chase. We have a number of novel therapies um, that are combined in some cases with chemotherapies to treat our patients. Um, 
when thinking about, um, again, another theme that we see across our clinical trials, um, there is a, an approach to treating patients who are resistant, who are, whose diseases are resistant to chemotherapy, in co-opting the immune system to overcome that resistance. And it is uh, truly um, the case that when an aggressive lymphoma in particular is resistant to chemotherapy, we need to find other strategies to overcome um, that problem. And the immune system and using the, the patient's immune system um, has thankfully uh, been one successful way to approach that. And you heard Dr. Styler talk a little bit about CAR T therapy, and that's been one of the very exciting and FDA approved advancements in the treatment of relapsed refractory diffuse large B cell lymphoma and now follicular lymphoma. Those are two B cell malignancies that I treat. Um, in terms of other indolent lymphomas or CLL, the approach more generally is to use novel or targeted therapies. Um, for CLL patients, we rarely have a discussion around chemotherapy these days. Um, we will sometimes broach chemotherapy with a very young CLL patient with all favorable features because of the very um, excellent and potential long-term uh, progression-free survival that can be achieved with a regimen like FCR. That's a very, very rare discussion that we have. Typically, uh, our CLL patients are managed very successfully with drugs like venetoclax or one of the um, newer BTK inhibitors. And we will be having trials for our CLL patients that um, combine a venetoclax with um, anti-CD20 therapy, as well as some of the new and not yet FDA-approved uh, BTK inhibitors. Um, within the, uh, the realm of therapeutics for aggressive uh, lymphomas, we have bispecific antibodies that Dr. Styler also alluded to. Um, and these uh, drugs, they're not FDA-approved and only available in the context of clinical trials um, are very promising. And we've seen um, some uh, very exciting results um, presented at uh, large um, meetings, including the American Society of Hematology meeting this year and last year that demonstrated that patients who were refractory to not only uh, chemotherapy and CAR-T therapy, uh, could be salvaged with a bispecific antibody. Bispecific antibodies um, uh, utilize um, two moieties to, uh, to, one, recognize a protein on the cancer cell or lymphoma cell in this case, and also will recognize a protein on T cells. So they bring the cytotoxic T cell uh, close to the lymphoma and thereby affect uh, an immune response that um, in many cases can eradicate the lymphoma. Um, other uh, immune-related treatments that we have available in clinical trial and outside of clinical trial include checkpoint inhibitor therapy. Uh, you may have heard of uh, checkpoint inhibitors um, or seen commercials for checkpoint inhibitors for many different types of cancers. Um, but they are being used to treat lymphomas as well. They are particularly effective when treating uh, patients with Hodgkin lymphoma that hasn't responded well to frontline therapy. Um, we have a clinical trial currently at Fox Chase for patients with Hodgkin's lymphoma who have never received treatment. And that's a, a very interesting study because it uh, really aims to try to change the way that we treat Hodgkin lymphoma um, in the United in the United States and and across uh, the globe by incorporating a checkpoint inhibitor with a chemotherapy backbone in one arm and in the other arm there is uh, a combination of an anti CD30 antibody with chemotherapy and so um, this is a very large phase three study that will accrue over a thousand patients in Canada and the US, and the results may be uh, paradigm shifting again. So there are, um, there, there are so many lymphomas, it's hard to 
um, really drill down on the specifics of the therapeutics for, for each of the various types of non-Hodgkin lymphoma and Hodgkin lymphoma. Um, however, I think, um, again, it's a very exciting time for both clinicians and patients because we're seeing um, really great results with uh, patients not only on trials, but patients who are being treated with FDA-approved therapies. And um, thankfully, um, many of the newer therapies have um, gotten uh, smarter and are able to overcome resistance without exposing patients to the significant toxicities uh, that we had seen previously with very intensive chemotherapeutic regimens. All right. Thanks, Nadia. That was great. Um, Thank so you. Now we're going to hear from, from Sue McHale, who's a uh, nurse manager. So, Sue? Hi. Good evening, everyone. My name is Suzanne McHale. I'm the nurse manager for the Fox Chase Temple Bone Marrow Transplant Program. Uh, we are located on the fifth floor at the Gene Campus Hospital, just across the street from Fox Chase Cancer Center. Um, I have been with the program for 21 years. Before I was manager, I was a staff nurse in the outpatient BMT clinic. And I also did a couple of years over in the Fox Chase infusion room where um, a lot of you are getting your treatments at currently. Um, my specialty was apheresis and that's the way that we collect those stem cells that the doctors are talking about for CAR T or for transplant. Um, a common misconception that I hear a lot of patients say is that they think transplant means they're going to the operating room and they're having this surgery. Um, not true at all, not since the 90s. Early 90s, we started to take it from your peripheral blood. So just like a dialysis machine, you would go on this machine for a couple of hours. We would take a small, small tiny volume of your blood that contained these stem cells. Um, and then the stem cell lab technician would come and cryopreserve it until you were ready for your transplant and they will fill it at bedside and you would be infused. It's very, the infusion is much quicker than the collection. Um, so it's relatively painless. It's just, it's a boring day. You're on the machine for a couple hours and there's not much to do. Um, but like I said, our, we're on the fifth floor of Jean's hospital, the inpatient and the outpatient unit. So in the outpatient unit, you would have all everything done in one, one place. You'd have your blood work drawn, you would see your physician or your provider. Um, you'll have your chemotherapy treatment or your blood transfusion or your apheresis procedure, and we'll send you on your way. On the inpatient unit, we'll do your transplant. Um, a lot of times, some of the chemo regimens have to be done as an inpatient, so we'll do that there. And we'll also bring you back if you have any complications from your treatment or your transplant. Um, so the nurses, they're there for you. Um, I can promise you on either side, the BMT program or over at Fox Chase Cancer Center, they are dedicated, very experienced, very knowledgeable, and 100% um, there for you. And their number one priority is your safety and well-being. Um, I've witnessed it, and like I said, 21 years with this program, um, you're in good hands, I promise. Thanks, Sue. Um, I've never been a patient, so this has been informative for me. So thanks. Um, so our next panelist is Jen Costello, who's a transplant, uh, transplant coordinator. So Jen. Hi, and good evening. Uh, I'm Jennifer Costello. I'm a transplant coordinator at the BMT program. I've been with the program for about 10 years and in this role for three. And I'm just gonna speak briefly about how patients establish their care within our program. And that first starts with a consultation with one of the transplant physicians. If they recommend transplant or cellular therapy, you've heard us refer to CAR T cell therapy most often, then they're referred to a transplant coordinator. If that visit took place in our program, we will go and meet with the patient in the clinic or we will follow up with them via a phone call. And we'll provide information just to you know, go over the basics of what the transplant physician had said. We try to break it down into basics and give it to the patient in the various steps. Um, we'll explain how many visits will be required in the upfront phase, 
whether the therapy is delivered on the inpatient unit or in the outpatient setting, and what to expect in follow-up. A very important step is the pre-transplant testing. And we try to do that as one long day at the transplant program. On that day, we'll meet with the patients if we haven't met them face-to-face, -face, just so they can put a face to a name. We'll also do a lot of tests, and some of that is blood work. And it can include a lot of tubes of blood. So we'll say to the patient, you're going to get a lot of tubes of blood, John. And we explain what those are. We will also do tests to look at the heart, which could include an EKG, which is the sticky tabs on the chest to see how the electricity flows through, or an echocardiogram, which is an ultrasound of the heart. Some patients will get pulmonary function tests, which is a breathing test where you actually have to work kind of hard. We might do a bone marrow biopsy. And we'll talk to the patient about how that's done ask if they've had one in the past and where was it done? In the clinic, at in the inpatient unit, or was it done in a little operating room? So that the patient is informed and educated and has a say in how we schedule their treatments. I'm also a registered nurse, so it's my job to explain the process and talk to the patient about the medicines that we're gonna give and the side effects, but we know that there's so much more to it than that. And so a social worker will meet with a patient during that workup day. And they will talk to them about practical things like who will walk the dog, cut the grass, who pays the bills? How have you done with your diagnosis to date? Um, have you had any issues or any problems in the past with substance use or, or uh, mental health issues? You know, How can we identify what barriers may be and help you through those barriers? For patients who travel from a distance, we'll talk to them about travel and also local lodging if that's needed. Following that testing day, we bring the results together, present them to the panel of physicians, and they make the call about moving forward or not, what medicines are used, and what doses. And then we set up a personalized calendar for each patient that has their appointments on it, their arrival times, things like that. If the patient is going to get a transplant that involves a donor, it's our job to help find that donor. We will look within the family. We'll also look within the national registry, which is called Be The Match. Um, that's throughout the United States, but it has a global reach throughout the world. And we'll get those cells if we need to be a plane, train, or automobile here for your transplant. We work with the financial coordinators to obtain the authorization for the transplant and then facilitate the admission. And then once the patient is brought into the hospital, we, we wish them well and hand the reins over to the inpatient team. After discharge, they're managed by the outpatient team. And we're just those people that they met at the beginning of their, their journey. Uh, the, the process for CAR T-cell is very similar. The tests um, for pre-transplant testing can be a little different, but again, they're all, you know, what's been prescribed by the attending physician, and we help the patients get those done in a timely manner. And that's my role uh, in helping patients through their journey. All right. Thanks, Jen. Um, so Jen touched a little bit on what social workers do. And so as luck would have it, our next panelist is a social worker, Lisa Atkins. So Lisa, take it away. Hi, good evening. Yes, my name is Lisa Atkins, and I have been a Fox Chase for 15 years now. So I've watched a whole lot of physicians come and go, but we're very lucky to have those who are here with us. Um, there is so much in tonight's talk. So I'm going to try to just say, as a social worker, we try to take everything that everybody just said and try to make sense of that. Um, I always say that I wear many hats when dealing with patients. Um, I tend to meet patients in the clinic when they come for their first visit. Um, and basically I just tell them who I am. I don't even go further because that first appointment when patients are coming to Fox Chase, they don't remember anything but maybe a face or that they have a diagnosis and that's about it. And then it's probably like the 20th time that someone says it, that they might really understand it. That's when I get a lot of calls. And the calls come in because they're scared. They don't know who to turn to. They don't know what to say or ask or who to start with. So I say, you can always try me, not unless it's medical. If it's medical, call phone triage, please. But start with me if you don't know, and we'll work together to figure it out. I don't always pretend that I know everything because everything changes daily, especially at Fox Chase <laughs> and in today's world. Um, so I, I try to just figure it out. 
and walk them through to meet all the players that they have to meet. At, at both the um, bone marrow transplant unit and at the um, cancer center side, we're lucky enough to have social workers that deal with all different specialties. So there are counterparts to my role at Fox Chase to the BMT. They're very specialized and know probably a lot more resources for the transplanted patients. Um, but we're always willing to work together and collaborate because we have patients that cross over. Um, unfortunately, we have patients who go through their frontline treatment and unfortunately have to get more treatment. We try to be with them in every moment that they are experiencing treatment, whether it's, you know, they got admitted for a fever. Nobody wants to be admitted to the hospital, especially during COVID, um, because you can't see anybody. You can't talk to anybody except your family via FaceTime. It's very challenging. But, you know, the social workers, the nurses, the doctors were all there to help try to ride this roller coaster and, you know, get through the hardest times. Um, we're there to provide hope and wisdom throughout the whole journey. And hopefully we can connect with resources. There's a ton of financial resources for the heme malignancies that we're lucky to tap into. And they vary from helping with transportation. Um, certain um, disease sites have specific funds for their um, medication assistance. So we try to help with that, but you know, the, the list is, is forever long, but we are here to help walk you through from beginning to end to middle, all of it and above. And we're here to just try to make you smile, especially during the down days and then see you make us smile. So luckily we have a really good team and I hope we have a lot of questions that we can answer tonight. Great, thanks Lisa. Um, I can tell you that you know, having not taken the patient journey myself, it's comforting to know that not only are there great docs to treat my disease, but there are great people to help me everywhere, every step along the way from the time I walk in the door uh, and address every question I might have uh, as far as complications or who takes care of things when I'm unable to. So thanks everybody for that. So the time uh, has come to field questions and there are many. Um, and so I'm going to do my best to get us through um, some of these questions. And uh, as I said in the beginning, you know, if, if you have questions and didn't ask them yet, please do, because even if we can't get to them before the program closes, we'll answer them afterwards. Okay, so please just put them in the, in the chat window in, in Facebook if you're listening that way. So the first question um, actually comes from a Hodgkin's lymphoma patient at Fox Chase, um, who was diagnosed in 2016 and is still being monitored, uh, currently taking a 20 meg dose of Xarelto, wants to explore the idea of, um, of turmeric as a holistic addition to um, the Xarelto. And so um, wants to know whether turmeric is a reasonable option. Uh, and so there's a question for uh, Michael. Uh, so if you, uh, and maybe if Nadia has some thoughts, she can address those as well. Uh, can you take that question, please? Sure. Um, so I assume that means that your disease is not currently active. Um, when, when patient, a lot of patients, it turns out, will take supplemental medications and non-approved medications when they're going through treatment. That's more problematic because we don't know how those, those things might interact with our, our drugs and might actually counteract their effectiveness. Um, it's less concerning if you're taking some, something to try to prevent your disease from coming back. There's really no known agents that will prevent Hodgkin's from coming back as far as I'm aware. There are lots of, of uh, natural products that seem to have anti-cancer, anti-tumor effects and might be beneficial. Often that's how we, we uh, advance things in the field. But every now and then we find that, that things that make sense that they might be helpful are actually harmful. Uh, there's a notorious example in, in um, patients with head and neck cancer who um, were given a, a vitamin uh, called beta carotene. And it turned out that, that those who took the beta carotene actually had a higher relapse rate than those who didn't. So you have to take all these, these non-approved treatments um, with, with a degree of caution. Um, Nadia, have anything to add to that? 
Sure. Um, you know, this is something that um, I encounter often in the clinic. I, I find that, you know, um, patients are, are very well read and um, some of these um, supplements and or, um, you know, nutraceuticals, I think, um, you know, hold a lot of promise. And it's true that um, a lot of a, a lot of the sort of natural um, uh, agents out there do have specific compounds that um, have bioactivity, and in, including t- turmeric, um, which has a potent antioxidant that can be um, extracted in the lab. The question, though, um, is what benefits um, do you get from taking turmeric supplements? And no one can... Um, answer that question adequately without studies to um, to understand what the real benefit is uh, for you. And I assume that the question that you that was posed has to do with um, anti you know an anticoagulant effect. Um, so without without having any you know scientific um, you know basis for recommending uh, turmeric you know for that indication, it would be um, it, it wouldn't be appropriate to um, replace uh, your anticoagulation with something like turmeric. Um, and certainly, you know, for who, for you who asked this question or for anyone out there who has a question about supplements, um, I would advise you to definitely talk with your oncologist about that and if it's something that they're not familiar with, um, you know, or you know, in my case, if I'm not familiar with one of the nutraceuticals, I'll look it up and we will talk together about incorporating it into, uh, you know, in, into uh, their you know dietary regimen. And you know, it's not to to really just poo-poo all of them and say that you know there's no benefit there, but um, we have to be certainly very careful in understanding what the actual benefit may be. And, and there's, you know, always a potential, you know, downside to, um, to anything that we take as well. Thanks, Nadia. Um, we have a second question for Suzanne McHale. Um, and uh, this person wants to know if you can discuss the typical side effects of chemo for blood cancers and how they're managed. Oh, sure. Um, so the typical side effects a lot of times are fatigue um, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, um, especially in the transplant world. Um, and, and it's just important to listen to your body when you're after a transplant and take your time. Um, those, that fatigue can last a very long time after transplant, but for chemo, um, we have a nutritionist who will work with you. Um, we also have many med- medicine options for to help treat nausea and vomiting and diarrhea. Um, of course, hair loss is always something, but with a lot of the newer drugs and the, and the pills, hair loss is not something to worry about. Um, I don't know. I just, I think that, you know, we, we try to work with everybody. It's their individual way that they're dealing with it and how they're affected. And we'll bring your physician into it and, you know, we'll find what helps. There's plenty of options though. We don't give up. We don't say, oh, well, that didn't work. We'll definitely move on to the next option and and work hard to make you feel better. Thanks, Suzanne. Um, Our next question is for uh, Jennifer Costello. Um, You touched a bit on how transplant matches are selected. Um, This questioner wants to know a little bit more about how one goes about determining whether a potential donor is a match? That's a very good question. So we each have proteins that sit on top of our white blood cells, and those are called human leukocyte antigens. So when a patient is being considered for transplant, we will draw a blood sample from that patient and send it off to the HLA lab. And they will give us a combination of letters and numbers. And then we type those into the national registry and it will perform a search throughout the world um, to see who matches those letters and numbers. Um, That combination of letters and numbers, you've inherited those from your parents who inherited them from their parents and from their parents. So 
your best chance of finding a match is someone who shares that same background as you. Um, and when it comes to joining the registry, we encourage as many people to join as can. You can go to the Be The Match website and look it up. Um, there are current pushes for donors between 18 and 44. And you can do that initial typing with a buckle swab. So a swab of your cheek, you don't even have to have blood drawn. We just encourage people that if you sign up to be on the registry, that you know that you could be called to help someone anywhere in the world. And so we ask for people who are really committed to that, um, to sign up and be on the registry. When it comes to looking within a family, there are um, you know, certain statistical odds of finding a match within a family. And so we often look at siblings um, because there's a chance that you got the same proteins as, you are, um, as your brother or sister. Um, when it comes to parents or children, they're by biology a half a match. And as Dr. Styler had mentioned, we are moving forward with haplo identical, haplo means half uh, matches. So that's sort of how we go about looking for donors for patients. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, next question is for Lisa Atkins. Um, this person asks, what are some of the psychosocial challenges associated with treatment for blood cancers and what are the support services that are offered? So the challenges that come with the psychosocial aspect are, um, well, I think it's kind of common in most cancers, but I believe that um, it's just, how did this happen? Um, a lot of patients want to know why and how it came about. And I try to help them move past that because a lot of times with lymphomas or um, the, I deal with more of the um, lymphomas and multiple myelomas and not the acute leukemics as, as on the other side, but um, we don't know where they came from. <laughs> so it's not like you smoked your whole life or you drank or you did this or you, you just were breathing and living. So when patients are told that they have a cancer that affects their whole body, um, that's, it's their whole bloodstream or this, they tend to be more, well, everybody's scared. So we talk about fear and anxiety and we talk about um, anger and all of those emotions at the same time. And that it's okay to be scared, it's okay to cry, it's okay to be angry, and all at the same time. So as far as what's available for support, we are licensed clinical social workers. So we do individual and family counseling at Fox Chase. We provide ongoing supportive therapy throughout their continuum of care. Um, we do reach out to a lot of the um, advocacy groups because they have a lot of buddy systems. Um, some of them are represented tonight and have sponsored the program. So we're lucky enough that there are a lot of patient support programs. And currently we don't have a running support group but um, at Fox Chase, but we do individual counseling as well. Sorry, I didn't unmute myself. Thanks, Lisa. <laughs> so our next question uh, comes from a leukemia patient um, who has had recurrence after having a stem cell transplant and wants to know whether uh, a second transplant is an option and whether that depends on the age of the patient. So I think that's probably one for uh, Michael. Sure. So um, there are a lot of nuances to, to that question. Um, it, it depends a bit on how long after the first transplant the disease came back, depends on the specific uh, type of leukemia, uh, whether there's still evidence that the cells from the, the donor are still uh, in the, the bone marrow, and of course, what kind of condition uh, you're in when, when you relapse. We like to wait at least a year between the first transplant and the second, just because it's thought to be too toxic to, to do it sooner than that. Some, for some conditions, if there's still a substantial number of donor cells in bone marrow, sometimes we can get a, a second remission simply by collecting some lymphocytes from the original donor and infusing them into the patient. And especially for uh, chronic myelogenous leukemia, which we don't do transplants very often for anymore, um, there's a high success rate in, in curing patients just with those lymphocytes alone. Um, but we, we can certainly do second and even third transplants occasionally. Uh, we try to design the, the regimen to make it as 
least toxic as, as possible. Sometimes we try to look for an alternative donor, uh, trying to do something different so that the disease doesn't come back again. Um, and of course, we, we would evaluate uh, your health very carefully and make sure that, that the, the risk of the transplant didn't outweigh the potential benefit. All right, thanks, Michael. Um, our next question is for uh, Nadia. Um, this comes from a patient who wants to know um, if you suffer from an autoimmune disease and lymphoma, is proton therapy an option or immunotherapy and any insights into alternative treatments and support for those conditions? Okay, sure. So uh, yeah, unfortunately, uh, autoimmune diseases tend to cluster with certain types of non-Hodgkin lymphoma, so that, that's a, um, a not uncommon scenario um, in, in the clinic. And um, often patients who have an autoimmune disorder um, will benefit from immune therapies that, and, and chemotherapies as well, because chemotherapies are very potent anti-inflammatories. Um, so they do halt um, the overactive immune response that is uh, underlying autoimmune conditions. Um, patients often find that their um, rheumatologic conditions, whether it be arthritis or other skin conditions, um, go into remission around the time of chemotherapy, and that re remission can be um, lasting af after treatment as well. Um, occasionally, we've even um, worked with patients, uh, rheumatologists, to uh, come up with a therapeutic regimen that will address um, both conditions. And, um, and, and that's, that's something that I, I think, you know, can be reasonably done depending on the, the specific scenario. But, um, you know, when we're talking about uh, proton therapy, which is radiation therapy versus immunotherapy, it really just depends on the, you know, the stage of the lymphoma, the kind of lymphoma, um, and, you know, whether systemic therapy or targeted therapy is appropriate. So it's, it's hard to um, address the specifics about proton therapy, but um, proton therapy specifically is not going to impact a, um, an autoimmune condition um, directly because um, it's a targeted, it's, phys it's a physically targeted approach uh, to treatment when there's one area of disease or um, a cluster of, um, of lymph nodes that can be contained within one um, radiation port, then the radiation or proton therapy, which is essentially the same thing, can be directed to that area. And that's not going to impact um, an autoimmune condition, but any systemic, so IV therapies or pill therapy um, would hopefully impact um, both the disease and autoimmune condition positively. Thanks, Nadia. Um, so our next question is for, for Dr. Styler. Um, yeah, and the question is, can you sort of explain autologous stem cell transplants versus CAR T's and what criteria to use to use one or the other? Uh, and can you tell me, or can you tell them how effective one is versus the other? Sure. So autologous transplant is basically a way that enables us to give a patient very high doses of chemotherapy that hopefully will overcome the resistance that the lymphoma, for instance, cells have to standard chemotherapy. And with that, maybe we can kill off the majority of the lymphoma cells and enable someone to, to be cured. The drugs are chosen so that as we go to these really high doses, the main toxic side effect is that we damage the bone marrow. And without a transplant, patients' blood counts would never recover or might take many months to recover and, and patients would die from an infection or some complication during that time. So we can get around that side effect by taking some stem cells ahead of time, putting them in a freezer. As soon as the toxic drugs are cleared from the system, we then reinfuse the stem cells, they settle down in the bone marrow, grow back and overcome that, that complication. For lymphomas, the, the best indicator of how someone how, how successful that will be is whether their lymphoma is still sensitive to standard dose chemotherapy. 
We know that standard dose chemotherapy virtually never can cure lymphoma at that point, but it is a good marker that if they respond to traditional therapy, we can then potentially cure them with the high dose therapy and transplant. So that's kind of the main role for an autologous transplant for lymphomas. CAR-T right now is being used primarily for more resistant lymphomas, ones that, that haven't responded very well to uh, salvage therapy. And even in that setting where it, it wouldn't be effective for uh, stem cell transplant, about 30 to 40% of patients are having long-term disease-free survival. So that's kind of the main way we, we choose the, the two options. Now, because CAR-T therapy seems to be a little less toxic than, than autologous transplant, we may consider uh, even patients with who, who would otherwise be a candidate for an autologous transplant, that is disease that's chemosensitive, uh, we might still offer a, a CAR-T transplant in that setting too. All right, thank you. Very, very clear. Um, next question is for Dr. Khan. Can you explain minimal residual disease and clonoseq? Um, this person, the questioner, hadn't heard of those before and wants to know where on the blood tests that they receive would they see this information? Okay, sure. So, um, Clonoseq is a uh, you know, is basically the the brand of uh, test um, that a, this company, Adaptive Sequenza, has made available, and, and now this is FDA approved um, for specific diseases, including uh, CLL for minimal residual disease, um, mantle cell lymphoma for minimal residual disease as well. So um, I assume that the question is uh, focused on uh, CLL. That's, so the clonoseq or adaptive sequenza test is something that, that clinicians can order. Um, and when, you're, when the, pathology, the pathology department um, has a contract with the company, um, the sample can be sent out from the clinic. What happens is the um, the uh, company receives uh, the the blood sample, and DNA is extracted from that blood sample, um, and certain um, primers are used in a what's called a, a PCR reaction. Um, just to I guess um, simplify um, the explanation, um, there are certain genetic sequences. Um, that are being looked at within the blood sample to determine um, if there's any detectable uh, lymphoma slash, you know, CLL DNA in the blood. Um, the test is, is very, very sensitive, and um, it is actually the most sensitive way to look for minimal residual disease. Um, in, it can detect um, uh, a sensitivity up to um, 10 to the minus 6. Um, so traditional uh, MRD or minimal residual disease testing for CLL had been uh, flow cytometry. If we're talking about something called 10-color flow, which corresponds to the number of um, antibodies that are used um, to detect the CLL cells, the sensitivity is uh, very good. It's 10 to the minus 5. So the hope is that um, very soon, um, not only at Fox Chase, but... Um, uh, across clinical trials and um, and clinical uh, practice, we'll be using uh, MRD directed testing to determine um, how to tailor therapy uh, for patients. Um, currently, we do test for MRD after a venetoclax based therapy for patients with CLL, and um, at some point when we're able to um, utilize the adaptive sequenza test, again, this is a special test, so it's not going to be something you're going to find on your uh, typical blood report. Um, it's when, and when it is ordered, the results will come separately, um, and you'll be able to see the heading adaptive sequenza at the top, um, and your doctor will be able to um, help interpret the results. Thanks, Nadia. Um, so next question is for, is for Michael. Um, this comes from an AML patient who's been taking guadacitabine for five years um, and wants to know what the status of this therapy is in AML treatment. So I believe that this is uh, still under FDA uh, evaluation and has, has not uh, 
yet than if approved. Thanks. So still experimental, still available, but not uh, not uh, frontline therapy yet. Right. Thanks, Michael. Um, and so now this is a very uh, current question, a very you know appropriate and current question, and it has to do with the COVID vaccine. And so this is a question for you, Michael, um, or or Nadia. What's the best COVID vaccine to get for someone who had a bone marrow transplant? So we don't know specifically. Um, we're also not sure how effective these vaccines will be because they rely on the immune system to be able to, to respond appropriately. Um, so as far as we know, I think they're all, well, the, the two main commercially approved ones are probably equally effective. Right now, what we're recommending is that about three months post-transplant patients receive the vaccine, but it's purely a, a best guess that by then they're off a lot of the immune suppression and may respond well to therapy. Um, for patients who are still undergoing therapy and have an opportunity to get the vaccine, we're not recommending interrupting treatment to, to try to maximize their, their benefit and are telling patients just to get the vaccine. Um, and probably we will do some antibody testing to see if they've developed uh, an effective response. Thank you, Michael. Do you have anything to add to that, Nadia? Um, this is such a great question. And it, not only does it pertain to our transplant patients, but our patients on uh, chemo immunotherapy, uh, because there is going to be B cell depletion. And, um, you know, when you're, when you're recovering or, or shortly after a, a therapy, or you're on therapy, um, it, it, it is not clear, just as Dr. Seiler said, that um, there can be an adic adequate immune response to the vaccine. Uh, my recommendation for all of my patients is to try to get uh, vaccinated as, um, as quickly as possible when not on therapy and when there has been, uh, there has been repopulation of the B cell repertoire. And uh, it, it really doesn't matter what the, the brand is. And, um, and certainly all of the vaccines are going to protect against, you know, the devastating um, effects of the COVID uh, virus. So it, it is Im imperative, um, especially for, for patients with lymphoma, to try to um, be protected. Well, one thing to add is, you know, we are pretty confident that patients who've gone through transplant or on active therapy don't seem to have a, a worse response to the vaccine. It doesn't endanger them at all. Thank you. Um, and so our, our last question is for Dr. Khan. It's from a patient uh, who has CLL who has peripheral neuropathy and wants to know if that's a common symptom. Uh, peripheral neuropathy, um, do, as it you know pertains to CLL, would be very uncommon. Um, so you know the question would be then you know what would be an alternative explanation for the peripheral neuropathy, and um, you know one of the important things to consider as well is the presence of a monoclonal protein. Um, we do find the presence of monoclonal proteins um, in a percentage of our CLL patients. Um, sometimes the protein can cause uh, peripheral neuropathy, um, other neurologic symptoms, um, or um, other uh, symptoms completely unrelated to the nervous system. Um, so that is something that should be looked at and that can be tested for very easily with a blood test. Um, a serum protein electrophoresis and immunofixation to look for a monoclonal protein. That would be the first thing that I would do, um, not knowing anything else about um, the neuropathy specific. Um, and then in order to better characterize the type of neuropathy, um, we would recommend uh, seeing a neurologist and getting um, an EMG electromyographic uh, study um, to, again, better understand uh, potentially uh, what is causing uh, the condition because CLL um, will typically begin in the bone marrow. Uh, these cells accumulate in the blood um, and even with very high cell counts, we don't see um, microvascular disease and we don't 
see um, nerve damage as a result. So it's something maybe indirectly related to the CLL or completely unrelated to the CLL. Thanks, Nadia. Uh, one comment I would make um, in, in that uh, regard is that uh, I had a recent conversation with a, with a pain specialist at Fox Chase named uh, Dr. Marcin Christwick. Uh, I'm probably butchering his name, but he is actually um, launching a study using a, a electrical stimulation device that um, deals with peripheral neuropathy. And the idea is you stimulate the the nerves just above the damaged area and that it tricks your brain into not recognizing the pain. Um, and so very interesting study. We've talked a little bit about how one would measure success under that, uh, in that situation. Um, so it might be something that could be of benefit to folks suffering from peripheral neuropathy sometime in the future. Um, so um, with that, that, that's really all the questions that we've received in the chat at this point. I think it's been a lively discussion. I've certainly learned a lot. I hope you have as well. Um, and so we appreciate you, uh, all of you, for dialing in and, uh, and listening to our uh, program. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it as much as, as I did. I want to thank our exhibitors and the advocacy organizations for supporting this program. Um, thank the survivors for sharing their, uh, their images and their uh, stories of, and words of encouragement uh, in the slideshow that you saw in the beginning. I want to thank all my colleagues who were uh, panelists tonight, Michael, Nadia, um, Sue, Jennifer, Lisa, uh, and one, one panelist who couldn't be here tonight because she wasn't feeling well is Tracy, so we hope she uh, feels better soon. Um, so there, I uh, just want to let you know there are two other Together Facing events coming up. There's one on head and neck cancer, which is April 14th, and another on prostate cancer on May 12th. So please uh, keep an eye out on your Facebook page uh, for notifications about those events. So thanks, everybody, for joining in. I uh, hope you had a great time. Uh, I certainly did. Take care.